you nervous? Jericho asked. A bit. Callahan admitted. After all, this is gonna be a long trip. Don't worry about it so much, Jericho said. It's going to be a lonely, exhausting, and stressful job, but you'll be saving the world. Besides, it's only 7 billion clicks, practically next door. Yeah, well, I'll miss you, buddy. Watch the fort. Keep safe. The two physics division operatives gave each other a high five, which became a handshake, which became a bro hug, which became a real hug. Because no matter how big of a badass manly physics division strike team operative you were, having one of your best friends sleep for a 10 year shift on the other side of the solar system was a bit of an emotional moment. No homo and all that, but Callahan admitted that he was going to miss this house, even if he did steal all the beers out of the fridge. Operative Callahan? The man in white collar said. I have your final mission briefing ready for you. Doc, I've been training for this mission for the past year. I think I know what's going to happen, Callahan said. Nonetheless, regulations are that I need to read you these briefings before you're allowed on the abortation path. Dr. Benjamin Flaherty, PH, DHD, said. All right, hit me, Callahan sighed. I'll make it fast. Dr. Flaherty reassured the agent. Here goes. In a few minutes, you will be transferred from this ship onto a barge located in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. That barge will be aborted by Thaumatological Working to Far Point Forward Operation Base. The barge will carry supplies and replacement personnel for Far Point Station. You recognize, by so volunteering for this mission, that apportation is a difficult, dangerous, an unpredictable process, and that your safe arrival at Fairpoint is not guaranteed. You also recognize that the process of abortation carries with it the possibility that your mind may become affected by a cognitohazardous entity. You finally recognize that Fairpoint Station is located in a dangerous operating area, and that you may suffer death, dismemberment, or injury due to the hazardous nature of the duty. Finally, you recognize that this assignment is for no less than 10 years, and that rescue or evacuation from Farpoint Station is next to impossible. Even by apportation, due to the distances and lack of tomatological personnel at the destination. Do you so acknowledge these statements as made to you? I acknowledge, Callahan said. Please, sign here. Then, there were another 12 statements to be made another series of documents to sign, one last health checkup, and a final recording of all his early assets, should he not return from where he was going. Finally, Dr. Flaherty put all of the papers into a manila folder and passed Callahan a portable hard drive. What's this, Doc? It's got every movie that came out this year on it, plus the full runs of a bunch of TV shows and a bunch of porn. Doc said, those guys at Farpoint need some distractions. Sounds like I'm going to be the one needing this. Callahan laughed. You're more right than you know. Good luck, Carl. Carl gave the dog one more handshake, then turned to walk down the ramp and onto the LCAC. He stepped aside for a bit as a rather large cylinder was loaded on the hovercraft by hand truck. The Tage secured the cylinder to the cargo compartment wall, then took a seat in the chair opposite. A few minutes later, the hovercraft emerged from the cruiser's well deck into the morning light, heading towards the pair of barges that were floating in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. Everything's looking well? The technician asked, his voice sounding dull and tinny through the helmet faceplate. Callahan nodded and gave the man a thumbs up. The technician nodded and gave Callahan a handshake, then closed the hatch of the capsule, leaving Callahan alone with his doves. The sound of the air slowly circulating inside his suit, his only companion. Through the capsule window, he could see the bright blue Pacific Ocean stretching to the horizon. Two small ships, two of the seven that formed a circle around the barges, 
floated in the distance. The tomatological resonators on their deck softly glowing in a dim bluish-purple light. Somewhere out there, a literal army of tomatologists were shaping and working the flow of Eve through the resonators, forming a working circle around the floating barges. Alright, he heard a voice say over his comms loop. We're at T-5 minutes. I need a go, no go for launch. Note 1? Go, sir. Note 2? Go. Note 3? We'll go, sir. Note 4? We'll go. Note 5? Go. Note 6? That's a go, sir. Note 7? All good, go. Payload? Go. Callahan said into his mic. Targeting? Go. Said another voice over the loop. NB row? We'll go. Computers? Go. I have all station reporting go for launch. Resuming the globe at T minus 5 minutes and counting. Note 1, energizing. Note 2, energizing. The next few minutes were a flurry of activity, as the tomatologists did their thing. Technical jargon and status reports flowed back and forth in a smooth exchange of information. Complications arose and were swiftly dealt with, and throughout all of it, the steady, periodic calls of T-4 minutes, T-3 minutes, and then it was T-10, 9, 8. Arsing. The window of the canopy suddenly darkened as white-hot arcs of energy erupted from the resonator's 30-foot-tall antennae, forming a giant, glowing star of energy in the middle of the ocean, with the barges and Callahan in the center. Callahan felt his hair stand on end, so Eve sparked enough of the glass and metal of the capsule walls. 7. 6. Notes at 100%. The air around him roared and screamed as the tremendous amount of magical energy were channeled into the structure of the working. 3, 2, 1, cast! The announcer voice was suddenly cut off, just as the world went black, and Galahan suddenly found himself 6.7 light hours away from the rest of his comms loop. It was as if someone had turned off the lights of the world. The sunny, bright Pacific Ocean had vanished, leaving Callahan in utter darkness, just before a sudden loud thunderclap rocked the capsule. Back on Earth, there was a loud, crashing thunderclap as the air rushed in to fill the void left by the disappearing barges. All seven ships rocked violently as the powerful waves pushed them back and forth. The dermatological backlash was almost worse. A good portion of the ocean water turned into blood, staining the ocean a deep red. Halfway around the world, a volcano that had not existed until then suddenly erupted for the ninth time in 100 years and was just as quickly banished from reality. And somewhere on Pluto, two barges appeared in the center of a carefully drawn abortation circle, covered in the frost and snow that had once been a few hundred cubic meters of air and seawater that surrounded the two vessels. And then, as Callahan's eyes adjusted to the darkness, he saw the most beautiful stars he'd ever seen in his life. And transfer complete, Davy said. We got our reinforcements. What does Verita say? Richie asked. Scanning now. I've got paratread signatures in Barge 2, as expected. Looks like it held. And our newcomer? The base commander asked. He checks out clean, stressed and terrified as hell, but no hitchhikers. Alright, send out Richards and Carter. Richie said. And let's see what Santa and his elves send us this year. The rapping on the window pane startled Callahan out of his own inspection in the gorgeous night sky. He turned his head to see a man in a spacesuit, gold tinted visor raised to reveal his face, waving cheerfully at him. As Callahan watched, the stranger flushed an audio cord into a port on the surface of the capsule. Test, 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 test. 
a voice rang in his ears. This is Richards, the capsule passenger. How do you read? Loud and clear, Richards, Callahan replied. I am Callahan. Cool. Nice to meet you, dude, the man said. Just hang tight for another moment. We'll get you out of there. Callahan waved back, and the spacesuit man moved on, continuing his inspection of the two barges for unexpected complications. It was a half hour later when the man returned, with a second agent in tow. Callahan felt a couple of thoughts as something was attached to his capsule, then they were tilted upward slightly, and he felt himself move. Glancing out of the side window, he could see that some sort of forklift, with its entire structure covered in insulating panels, had lifted up his capsule and was carrying it across the surface of the ice-covered rock. The man inside the vehicle, a broad-faced man with a big orange beard, waved cheerfully to him, then went back to the delicate procedure of moving the crew capsule to its destination. A few moments later, Callahan saw his new home come into view, a low series of structures, most of them in the shape of cylinders resting on their sides, illuminated with pale, bluish lighting. The logo of the Global Occult Coalition was inscribed on the side of each one. To one side, a bunch of open-topped crates held what appeared to be garbage bags or some other refuse. Some wag, he saw, had put up a sign outside the biggest building. Welcome to Farpoint Station, it read, Population 12. There was a figure in a spacesuit standing next to it. As Callahan passed by, he took down the plate that read 2 and put up one that read 3 in its place. The first impression that Callahan got when the airlock doors opened was one of claustrophobia. Everything was cramped and tight looking, and every single wall floor or ceiling surface was covered in instrumentation, equipment, supplies or lockers. The second impression that he got was the smiling woman standing in the middle of the room, wearing a loosely fitting set of grey trousers, jacket, gloves, as well as a full coverage face mask. Welcome to Clearpoint! She shouted, her voice muffled and teeny through the space helmet. Callahan nodded, then waited for a few minutes as the woman pulled herself into the capsule in a slow, languid motion, like she was underwater. It took her a few minutes to run the scanner all along the walls, floor, and ceiling of the capsule, checking for dust or hazardous chemicals. She then raised a bulky, older model Veritas unit and did a scan on his SIV signature, checking for any para-thread hitchhikers. Finally satisfied, she then put the scanner away on a holster at her hip and leaned her head in close to Callahan's helmet. You cannot take your suit now! She shouted. Callahan nodded and reached up to undo the collar of his helmet, the air he slightly, and he breathed in his first breath of air in his new home. It smelled kinda like armpits. Richie laughed as Callahan's nose wrinkled. Yeah. She admitted. It doesn't smell so great in here, but we've got a dozen... a baker's dozen now. Anyway, we've got 13 guys living in an enclosed environment, breathing in each other's body odor. You get used to it after a bit. That explains the crate of air fresheners? He asked, gesturing to the small, sealed box in the corner. Yeah. Richie admitted. They don't last, and after a while, you get sick of the pine tree smell, but it helps. She helped Callahan to undo the harness on his capsule, then pulled him to his feet. In the low gravity of Pluto, they rose up nearly all the way up to the ceiling before coming back down to the ground. Whoa. Callahan breathed. Yeah. Richie laughed. That's another thing you'll have to take a while to get used to. Anyway. Welcome to Icetown, the GOC most forward, forward operating base. Your job is mostly going to be blue color. Richie explained. Expanding the base, not that you brought the new module. 
maintaining the systems, watching over the depot, and, of course, taking readings and doing analysis of the deep space warning system. Do the probes ever pick up anything? Kolohan asked. Sometimes. I'll explain later. She threw her arm into a handle next to a low doorway and slid it open. So, this is your room for now. She said, gesturing to the interior of a storage cabinet filled with insulated bags of water. We'll put down a sleeping bag for you. It'll only be until we finish installing the new habitation models you brought up. Then we're all moving to our nice new quarters. What will you do with the old ones? We didn't have any. Richie admitted. We've just been sleeping wherever we can find space. I usually do it in the commander's chair, up in CNC. That sounds rough. You got no idea. Richie sighed. At least, I wasn't here when they were doing initial installation. Those guys had to live in their suits for a solid week before they could get the core module set up. Not a fun time. I met one of them during training. Colohan admitted. Agent Siphos. Oh, Swordy? How is the old fart? Haven't seen him since he's shot at home. He twitches a lot and still walks with a cane. Of course he does. The bastard like that wouldn't stay on a wheelchair for long. Rich agreements and shook her head. Full gravity sa- Anyway, leave your stuff here. I'll show you the bathroom and galley. And here we are, Richard said, grinning broadly. The depot, the coalition solution for the things they can't kill or negotiate with. The structure was massive, about the size of an aircraft hangar. All throughout the structure were cages, crates, and other containers, all of them open to the vacuum and freezing cold of deep space, each one labeled, numbered and marked with the seal of the Global Gold Coalition. Where do you want this one, Richie? Carter asked, as he maneuvered the small forklift into the building. Let's see him. Section 3, Richard said, consulting his roger-sized tablet computer, next to the heat eater. Carter deftly maneuvered the device into the back of the building and laid the cylinder down next to a big crate with a temperature gauge that hovered somewhere around absolute zero. So, Callahan? Richards asked. What is that thing, anyway? The container? Callahan asked. Type red. Expanding regenerator. Fire didn't work, so they tried ice. That worked, but when it ran out, it kept coming back to life. So, they kept it suspended in liquid nitrogen until it could come out here. Makes sense, Richard said. Hey! Want to see our UFO? You mean the actual set articulant scout ship? It's here? Yep, Richard said, grinning. And if you're real nice, I'll even let you sit in the pilot's seat. Sounds like a deal. You have no idea how good it is to taste actual chocolate again. Richie groaned as she took a bite of the Milky Way bar. Oh god. It's like testing heaven. Hey boss, Vanderbreg said, winning. You give me your orange and I'll give you my candy bar. Screw that, Van. Richie laughed. I'm going to savor every bite of this orange. It's the first time I had one in a year. I thought you guys had an aeroponics garden. Colohan asked. It doesn't have oranges. Richie pointed out. Kinda hard to grow an orange tree aeroponically. It does okay for tomatoes and onions, though. Ding ding ding! Carter shouted. He tossed a silvery drinks back to Callahan, who caught it. Alright guys, a toast to our new member, to Callahan, and may he find his place with us amongst the eyes and the dark. Here, I'll here, cheers! Callahan nodded gratefully to Carter, then took a big swing of his drink, only to kick and gas when, instead of the expected water, Something closer to pure ethanol hit the back of his throat. Everyone laughed and cheered, and clapped him on the back. Jesus Christ! Callahan groaned. Where the hell did you find this stuff? We distilled some of the leftover cars into alcohol. 
Carter grinned. I've got a steal. And High Command allows this? He grasped incredulously. High Command knows that we're out here for the long haul. Our bones slowly turning into mush, surrounded by helium lakes and hydrogen snow. Watching and waiting over the biggest depository of frozen paratrites in the solar system, short of their foundation's own stockpiles, and looking out for the invaders. We do our job, they forgive us our indulgences. Then, in that case, Callahan sighed. I'm glad that part of what I brought along here were a bunch of crates of orange juice powder. Screwdriver, anyone? And contact. Carter said, as the two structures met. Hard dog. Vanderbrook announced, as the looking latches hooked into place. Expanding the structure now. In the monitor, Callahan could see the first of the four new habitational modules for the base, slowly accordioning open, sliding and locking into place, like the world's most complicated and high-tech pop-up book. On another monitor, he could see Carter slowly backing his forklift out of the cylindrical micrometeorite shield that the operatives had constructed from flat pack parts over the course of the past week. When it had finished deploying, the habitation module would be separated from the hard outer shell by a gap of about 3 inches of vacuum, good insulation, and good micrometeorite shield as well. And that's deployment complete, Carter said. Let's put the end cap on and check out our new decks. Base commander gets for zips? Richie declared. Sorry, boss, Carter laughed. We agreed to draw straws, right? This seems remarkably unfair. Richie complained. You're the one who suggested it, boss. Carter pointed out. You can complain if you lose at your own game. Whatever. You're a bunch of fun. Richie pouted. Callahan yawned as he bounced slowly down the corridor towards the galley. It was night shift around the time when most of the station's inhabitants used to take their sleep cycle, and he needed a warm drink. He filled up a hot chocolate pouch with hot water from the galley, locked the requisition on the galley's computer, and started to head back to the storage closet that was still his quarters until the second half module finished construction. As he did so, he noticed a low, soft light coming from CIC. He lifted his way up to the ladder and into the base command center, which was located on an elevated module overlooking the rest of the base. The entire upper half of CIC was a giant observation dome made up of 13 windows in three concentric circles, and it had some of the best views of the entire base. Richie was there, sitting in the commander's chair. She had a blanket rubbed around her and she was starting intently into the night sky at the endless expanse of the untwinkling stars. She turned to look at Callahan, then smiled at him as she snuggled up in the blanket and stared out into the universe. Ever think about why we're out here? She asked softly. To protect humanity? Callahan replied. It was the strike the answer to that question. To watch for extraterrestrial threats? To guard the depot? No. Richie said, shaking her head. We could have put the depot on Antarctica, or the moon for that matter. And we could watch for extraterrestrial threats just as well using ground-based radar installations. Oh, then why? Callahan wondered. Why go through all this trouble to build a base out here in Pluto? If you can answer that question... Richie said, smiling wistfully. You'd make 13 people very happy. But I think I have an answer. She turned in her coach to face him, raising her head on the crook of her elbow. Why did you volunteer for this assignment? She asked. Callahan grimaced. He knew this was going to come up sooner or later. I was in strike, he said softly. I killed a lot of things. 
a lot of people. Then I couldn't keep killing. I was done shooting things. He took the seat next to her at the operation center and played deadly with a frayed bit of upholstery on the left armrest. And when I heard about this assignment, I figured it would be a good chance to do something else. To help the GOC in a way that didn't involve killing people anymore. For me, it was assessment. Richie said softly. There was a school in Newark. Akati took out an entire third grade classroom. I had to watch and monitor it happening. We didn't have the assets to take it down. By the time strike arrived... She shuddered inwardly at the memory. So that's why Fairpoint exists? Galahan asked bitterly. So the GOC can stash away its broken agents somewhere far away from normal people? I don't think that's it either. Richie said. She sat up and took a moment to wrap the blanket around her shoulders. I think it's simpler than that. I think we might be an emergency backup supply for humans, in case Earth gets destroyed. Or maybe we're meant to be a bunch of canaries in the coal mine against alien invasion. Or maybe we're just here to prove that humanity could do this, even if we had to do it in secret from the rest of the world. Maybe we're here so that when humanity finally reaches this far, they'll be able to see that we've already been here all along, and we're waiting to help them reach even further. She got up from her chair and let the blanket fall. She was wearing her tank top and shorts, Callahan saw, and he felt his heart race as the low gravity did charming things to her bust line. Maybe we're out here just to be humans. She whispered as she slid into the chair next to him and kissed him. Afterwards, he laughed at the absurdity of it all as they cuddled together under the blanket under the starlight. <laughs> I have to admit it, this is a new one for me. Callahan chuckled. There's a first time for everything. Richie giggled. Just think, so... If only we could tell the world. We could answer so many questions for them about sex in space. I'm ready to keep experimenting if you are. Callahan grinned. We've got another hour until night shift ends. Richie pointed out. Plenty of time. Up above them, the stars slowly turn in their unending dance.